Hello, my name is Fatia Gamar. I'm a research advisor with CGG. The title of my lecture today is Automatic Gas Pocket Detection by High Resolution Volumetric Q Tomography Using Accurate Frequency Peak Estimation. During this presentation, I will talk about the use of Q tomography and Q PSDM to recover energy lost below gas pocket. The first question we'd like to answer is which is the reason why we want to take care of the absorption, usually described with the quality factor Q? The seismic waves propagating through subsurface are affected by frequency-dependent absorption, commonly named Q, where low Q values indicate strong absorption. The absorption results in the loss of amplitude signal and in reduction in bandwidth masking thus the structures beneath strong absorption areas. If not compensated or quanted for, the absorption can lead to incorrect velocity model and misleading AVU attribute and reservoir properties. In this presentation, we will focus our attention on the strong absorption caused by shallow gas pockets and how we succeed in improving the imaging with the Q-tomography and the Q-PSDM. Then to obtain the image we have on the bottom side, on the bottom left side, we need to do accurate Q-PSDM using accurate absorption model obtained by tomography. The most important in this case, in this work, is that we manage to detect these strong anomalies without any input to the tomography. That means that we don't have any a priori information on the localization of these gas anomalies. Now, as a reminder, let's see with a simple example the effects of the absorption on seismics. Here we have two synthetic gathers, both without any AVU and stretch effect. The red gather is affected by absorption we can see a change in wavelet shape with offset, then the amplitude is decreasing over offset. Now, stacking these two events, we get a reduced resolution on, of the events affected by a Q. The amplitude spectrum of the associated stack show loss in amplitude, a reduction in bandwidth, and also a frequency peak moving toward the lo towards the low frequencies. Moreover, we get a gradient different from zero, even if the decrease in amplitude with offset is related to the absorption and not to a real AVU response. Then we got a biased AVU if we don't correct for Q. Now, after this brief introduction on this, for this work, here we have the outline of the presentation. First, we will begin by showing the volumetric Q tomography and the picking of effective Q using the frequency peak shift method. And then we'll show the result of the application on Brunei offshore data and we'll see continuous Q peaking results, the Q tomography and the Q PSDM result. And then we'll conclude. Now, as we have seen in the previous slide, the absorption results in a shift of the amplitude spectrum from the high to low frequencies. For this reason, we decided to estimate the quality factor using a method called frequency peak shift. As demonstrated by Zhang and Ulrich in 2002, the spectrum of a wavelet propagating in the Earth can be approximated by a Ricoeur wavelet spectrum. In this example, we have reference wavelet at time zero, its associated spectrum in black. This wavelet is propagating in absorptive medium Q equal to 50 in this example. And with the second equation, we can compute its spectrum at time T1, T2 and T3. You see that here we have a frequency peak shift moving to the low frequencies. This frequency shift is corresponding 
to the max this peak frequency is corresponding to the maximum amplitude and it's moving to low frequencies looking now for the zero of the derivative we can derive q using this equation now the idea to approximate the spectrum of real data with the recurve works fine in many situations but the typical low signal to noise ratio observed on real data can make the data faking by a recurve wavelet quite difficult here we propose to replace this fitting by the computation of the autocorrelation of the signal in sliding short time windows then computing the spectrum of the autocorrelation in a window around the maximum peak we obtain the blue curve we can notice the good fitting with the real data and also the matching with a recurve wavelet spectrum this approach is easier and allow us to have a more precise peaking of the frequency peak shift and as a consequence a more accurate Q estimation. Now let's check the validity of our approach on synthetic example to show why the autocorrelation is K to compute reliable effective Q values. Here we have a record wavelet and then the same record wavelet where we added a high level noise and the autocorrelation of the noisy wavelet. As you can see, the wavelet obtained with the autocorrelation is looking similar to the recall wavelet without noise. Now, when we compute the amplitude spectra of the wavelet showed on the previous slide for the original recall reference on the top, the noisy recall in the middle, and the autocore on the bottom side. As I said earlier, we compute the amplitude spectrum of the autocorrelation only around the maximum peak. This will avoid including the side lobes of the autocorrelation in the amplitude spectrum, allowing more accurate signal frequency peak estimation and also makes the signal's amplitude spectrum more similar to the recall wavelets, as you can see it on the bottom side comparing to the reference on the top. We can notice then that the spectrum is very similar. These two spectrums are very similar. Even applying now a smoothing on the spectrum of the noisy recur, we can struggle getting a closer spectrum. Computing the frequency peak and the associated value, Q value, we can observe that using the autocorrelation, we can better retrieve the real U value of 120 in this example. Now, after this description of our methodology, I will show you here the flow, the complete flow used on Brunei data. First, then the starting point is a set of pre-stack CIG gathers without NMO to avoid stretch and converted back to time domain. We use the frequency shift peak method to obtain a dense effective Q volume in four dimensions. Time, cross line, in line, and offset. We really compute Q for each sample. Then this information, this dense information, will feed the tomography to obtain an interval Q model. Then after appropriated QCs, this Q model will be one of the input of our migration, of our QPSDM. Let's see now the result of the frequency peak shift on the real offshore Brunei data. And on the left hand side here, we have one near offset section where we have indicated the shallow gas pocket typical of the Brunei region by red here. The strong anomalies affect the coherency and the amplitude of the structure beneath. On the right side hand, we have the associated effective Q computed continuously by frequency peak shift. We can clearly see that the area of low Q values in black, in this example, match quite well the location of the shallow gas anomalies. This dense effective Q will feed our tomographic inversion and will check the capability of our method 
to detect automatically the gas anomalies without any information, a priori information, on their localization. Now, let's talk about the cost function we used in the Q tomography inversion and the interval Q we got from Brunei dataset. And the Q tomography provides consistent 3D model and it will allow positioning the Q anomalies and denoise then the effective Q data. It will invert the volumetric effective Q quantities to estimate an interval Q model. The inversion process aims to minimize the difference dt star, then t star is attenuated travel time, between the attenuated t star calculated from an initial Q model, for example, a constant gridded Q model, and the T star observed or estimated on the data from the shift of the frequency peak I showed before. And here is the PSDM data. The gas anomalies are shown by the red circles. And here is the inverted Q volume computed by Q tomography automatically. It's spatial varying 3D Q model. The inverted Q model follows the geological structures. Despite the complexity of the geology, the gas anomalies were all automatically detected by the volumetric Q tomography. Now, if we compare this interval Q model to the velocity model, here is the high definition velocity model, we see that the location of the gas pocket revealed by the Q tomography match quite well the high resolution velocity model showing low velocity anomalies in those gas areas. And Q model, velocity model, Q model, velocity model. Now let's check the effect of the volumetric Q on the imaging. Here are the PSDM and the QPSDM stacks with true amplitude. We can see that the amplitude is more balanced after QPSDM between shallow and deep of the section. This is confirmed by the spectra here. If we look at this normalized spectra, we see that the high frequencies are recovered quite well and the QPSDM broaden the spectrum. For easier comparison now, we scaled the amplitude and we would like to focus just on the change in resolution. Then here is the Brunei dataset PSDM stack section. And here is the QPSDM section. Then the PSDM section the QPSDM section. Then using the QPSDM, we get better fault definition as highlighted by the yellow arrows here. And generally we improve the resolution of the reflected events. Then the events became more visible and some, uh, some events uh, appear. Looking this time in Prestac domain, here we have the PSDM CIGs and then the QPSDM CIGs. PSDM, QPSDM, PSDM, QPSDM. And on the QPSDM CIGs, the increased resolution is effective for all offsets. Many events are now visible after QPSDM that will allow a more easier RMO peaking, for example, if we want to, to do a new velocity update. Now, let's summarize, then, we showed that the volumetric Q tomography reveals automatically localized attenuation without any a priori information on their localization, without any constraint of the tomography. This was possible thanks to an accurate frequency peak shift peaking obtained through autocorrelation of the data. Then here we used auto we used spectrum computed on autocorrelation uh, of the data instead of computing the spectra on the data itself. Then the interval Q model is consistent with the high definition velocity tomography model showing low velocities 
and low Q in the gas pocket. The Q was also geologically consistent. Then we see that the resolution is enhanced when we use interval Q during the imaging process. And many reflectors become visible and the energy is retrieved under the gas pocket. I would like now to thank Total and CA1 and partners for the permission to present the real data and CGG for the permission to publish the work. I also want to thank my colleagues Laurent Lopez, Kevin Sheen and Gilles Lombaré for their help and suggestion. Thank you for your attention. You can like and share this video. For more e-lectures, take a look at the EIG lecture playlist.